five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey, space enthusiasts. My guest this week is the head of strategy of well-known, publicly listed German space company OHB. Egbert Jan van der Veen, he's also the head of their corporate venture capital arm, which has invested in a number of well-known space companies, including some that have been on this podcast. So he has a really good view of the space sector in general, and also specifically about what is going on with space startups. Enjoy. By the way, happy Thanksgiving's holiday to our many listeners in the United States. My name is Raphael Rodkin, and I'm an investor and advisor to space companies. Just as a reminder, this podcast is for informational purposes only and nothing should be taken as investment advice. This podcast is sponsored by Nanoavionics, a satellite manufacturer and mission integrator. Their technologies enable many space companies worldwide to offer services that improve life right here on Earth, such as providing global connectivity, conducting Earth observation or contributing to scientific discoveries. Check them out and also check out my episode with their CEO and co-founder. Sadly, I am not a rocket scientist, but I'm an alumnus of the International Space University. ISU offers a number of educational programs about space worldwide. Check them out at isunet.edu. And just some final things before we start the episode about ourselves. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple or Spotify. If you want us help, expand our work, you can do so and support us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. And we'll also put that link in the episode notes. And lastly, you can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Today, I'm here with Eckbert Jan van der Wein from OHB. Hi, Eckbert. Hi, thank you for uh, for the invite. I'm looking forward to being here. <laughs> it's a pleasure. I think this this one was, was long overdue as a um, I was just, we were just chatting right before we started recording that. We're kind of talking all the time anyway, so we might as well record one of the conversations that might be, you know, interesting for some of the other people in space. But why don't you start telling us what, what you actually do? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so my name is Egbert. I'm uh, working in uh, space since, I don't know, like 14, 15 years right now. Uh, my background is more into technology and innovation management. Uh, I did a study mm -hmm. on industrial engineering and management. Uh, and then basically, uh, I kind of rolled into the space sector <laughs> by chance. Um, it was not really mm -hmm. planned. I uh, didn't really study anything like that. When I was a child, I was very much enthusiastic about space. I went to the space expo and in Nordweg when I was very young and I got the early flavor there but never really thought I could work in that and then I just kind of rolled into it uh, mm -hmm. yeah and I basically did uh, technology and innovation for a long time at the DLR and then also at AUHB I was responsible for all technology and, uh, and innovation development there for all of the coordination of those activities for about I think six or seven years uh, and now mm -hmm. since four years uh, my official role is uh, is head of strategy for OHB uh, which means that mm -hmm. I do all of the future development uh, for for our company, where do we go in the future? What is our strategic plan? Uh, part of that is also corporate development, so the development of a new area, mm -hmm. the integration of several companies within each other, the, mm -hmm. the sales of, of companies as well. We haven't done that so far, but we've only acquired so far, but, but theoretically mm -hmm. it could be part of it. Um, and then I have a small little hobby on this side, which is taking ridiculously amount of my time, more than it should normally, but that's, uh, that's venture mm -hmm. capital. So I'm, uh, mm. I'm a director for the OHP Venture Capital, which is a strategic uh, corporate venture capital arm of the OHP Group. Mm. That's, that's, that's a nice hobby to have. But let's start at the beginning of some of the things you said here. So you, you said you got into space by chance. Could you just expand a little bit on that? I'm, I'm just asking because, you know, I think there's more and more people who are not yet in space, but they're sort of interested um, to get into space. So these kind of stories are interesting to see, you know, how people actually slip into the space sector. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, for me, it was just, uh, I, w I wanted to go to Bremen. I had a, had a girlfriend at the time and uh, she was German and uh, she was studying in Bremen. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, what could I do there? So I was looking for uh, a way to do a master thesis and uh, found mm -hmm. several several ways to do that in Bremen and one of them was at the, the DLR Institute of Space Systems which was a uh, mm -hmm. was just recently funded there founded there so it was completely new and they had a, a very nice uh, uh, master thesis uh, work on disruptive space technologies uh, which mm -hmm. was very cool uh, I thought it was really nice so um, yeah I decided to create something with space <laughs> I can use my background yeah. there it focuses a lot of my focus on technology and innovation which I did more in my studies I was focusing more 
more on different kind of agricultural and sustainable technologies, but I thought space, why not? It's very cool as well. Mm-hmm. So then I kind of rolled into that. And then uh, after my master's thesis, I kept on there as a researcher. I, I wrote my PhD on the topic, didn't mm-hmm. finish it, but, but uh, came very far. Uh, yeah, and I'm focusing ma- mainly on the topic of uh, disruptive uh, technologies, where then I did also several studies for, for ESA and the European Commission and DLR internal studies. So back then there was a huge wave of, of disruptive technologies. What are they? It was a new term. And then we tried to find that out. What, what does it mean for space? Let's say, how do technology and innovation cycles work in the space sector yeah um, around what time was that roughly which years are we talking about here uh, 2009 2010 i think to, yeah some okay later yeah now. I'm, 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 I'm only asking, right, because this is, you know, it's clearly, as I imagine, this is clearly sort of like, I mean, right now space is more and more in the news, right? And people are sort of talking about space being dis- disruptive and uh, disruptive mm-hmm. technologies. But back then, uh, this was a much more, you know, uh, less publicly known field. Mm-hmm. So kind of with the hindsight, I'm kind of curious just to know sort of like what, what would have been examples of the disruptive technologies people were looking at in space? I mean, back, back in the in those days, I mean, uh, so we, what we did is uh, several forecast studies and everything. So it's good to see, let's mm-hmm. say, hindsight what worked and what didn't work. Uh, yeah. I mean, we, we very much believed into the 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 advent of of uh, of three uh, D printed technologies, which. Mm-hmm. Partially happened, partially didn't. I mean, most satellites mm-hmm. flying nowadays have uh, 3D printed uh, metallic parts. Uh, we, of course, also said like in space manufacturing that has taken a little bit longer, but but it's starting now as well. Uh, so those kind of things, uh, we're focusing on new battery technologies, new solar cells, and those kind of things. This have been taking a little bit longer, but are coming there as well. Flexible solar panels, for example. Uh, yeah, so so those things are are coming, but a little bit more slowly than we thought. Uh, rise of onboard processing we said which is definitely mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, a, a case which is happening right now both in the telecom and earth observation so that's definitely mm-hmm. uh, something to focus on uh, we also forecasted at the time quantum technologies in space focusing mainly on QKD but also quantum sensing mm-hmm. uh, which is which is currently now happening as well I mean basically we, we, what we did is well the forecast we said okay next five years what we realized right now back then we should have probably said 10 years <laughs> Everything in space just yeah. moves a little bit slower than <laughs> than we we initially thought, but but it is getting there. So you can already see that uh, yeah. some of them are being, let's say, operationalized, commercialized, uh, at least more talked about partially. So uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's this famous quote. I forgot somebody who said, "Right, the technology it like tends to move. It tends to move slower than people think in the short term, but then faster, like over the longer time frame." It's probably, yeah. I guess, hopefully true for for space as well. So, like, I think. Pretty much all of the things you mentioned are basically sort of on the hardware upstream side. Just out of curiosity, did you guys sort of think about like downstream, what might happen in downstream as well? Um, so the focus at that time was really, I mean, disruptive space technology focusing on hardware. So we basically only mm. launchers and satellites and then primarily yeah. focus on satellite technology. So downstream, not too much, no, um, because mm. it's... I mean, it's more related to other areas. For me, the downstream space is is a enabler. It's a logistics kind of thing, but it's not a, a driver. I mean, the biggest thing happening on downstream, for example, are, are automated uh, processes and then artificial intelligence and machine learning and those kind of things. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's the driver mm-hmm. in that space. Uh, it's just a, a user, potentially. And then uh, you said your PhD thesis was on the same topic? Yes, yes, focusing on disruptive uh, innovations. Yeah, at the time then I did a project together with, with OHB and then I was asked to join OHB and then mm. <laughs> it was not so easy to write a PhD on the side and uh, and do a management job yep. company. So slowly, you know, the, the the PhD thesis became older and older and it didn't progress and then at some point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you start in your time at OHB, did you start directly on the sort of in the business um, management side or did you ever work in a in a technical role? So, so I started in, in pre-development uh, doing studies uh, and and technology so it was working a lot of different proposals and those kind of things and then slowly mm. I, I build up the area of, of technology coordination uh, how the department was called so department was first me and then I hired a couple of new people uh, because mm. they had more and more need for example to do 3D printing and to do software technologies and those kind of things so then I built up a small apartment uh, uh, with a number of smart guys who were really enthusiastic uh, focusing on yeah different kind of things like uh, creative uh, maker space for example development I mean, we did the mm. crazy stuff basically we were basically the, the creative uh, guys within the 
within the company. So um, yeah, so that's uh, that's what I did then. But yeah, I mean, I was also responsible for many of the R and Ds that we developed. So uh, for example, I did the entire three uh, D printing or additive manufacturing uh, development uh, for for the company for about two to three years. So I know that quite well. Uh, I focus also on implementing art uh, augmented reality and virtual reality in the clean room environment. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. So those kind of things I did. So it usually was that um, I, I start different activities and then at some point <laughs> try to find somebody else who's more of a user or mm. more in a technical field to do it. But um, that was really mm. nice uh, mm. to, to be at the forefront or at least at the start of many of them. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I was to some extent you're sort of tr- almost straddling like business aspects and then some si- some of the technology things, right? Because I was going to ask you sort of one interesting question to ask about, you know, so deep tech company always is sort of the how, how the business side works together with the engineering side. <laughs> <laughs> how that interaction is yes yeah so so i mean i, I know the technical side or at least the, the difficulties you have in technology development for space quite good uh, i mean uh, honestly the business side only for me came later about 2019 or 2000, yeah, 2019 i started doing this this uh strategy and over to venture capital and, and those kind of things so then i started looking more into business models uh, um uh, to be honest mm. and more let's say product development for that was, was not really something i of course you look at the return of invest for example or business case for technology development or innovation uh, i mean innovation let's say technology development in itself doesn't help you as much it only becomes innovation once you you're able to market it and to successfully use it so um so i was thinking on that but to really look into a business plan of a company and everything was completely new for me but uh you're learning by doing so that's always good <laughs> yeah 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 and can you uh, because not everybody may know i mean i suspect some of our european listeners know ohp quite quite well but we have a lot of listeners also in you know, north america other parts of the world can you just kind of give us a summary of you know what ohp de- does like its core businesses and then kind of delve into the strategy to the extent you can talk about it yeah sure um so ohp is a family-owned company which is uh, a little bit weird into this domain. I mean, most, uh, let's say, people that, that make large satellites or satellite system integrators are uh, larger companies like Airbus and, and Tesla and Space or Boeing and Lockheed and, and those companies. Uh, so, so we are a family-owned company. We were founded in, I think, 1985 um, when mm-hmm. basically uh, the company was bought by uh, Mrs. Fuchs uh, who basically just wanted to do, didn't want to sit at, at home anymore so she just bought a company. It was a hydraulics company making things for the German submarines. And then uh, her husband, who was a very big uh, space fan and was also an engineer working at Erno, which is currently Airbus, he said, okay, mm. I'm, I'm going to work in this company as well and I'm going to transform it into a space company. So they just started doing, yeah, I mean, uh, high altitude rockets and, and um, yeah, basically small fridge sized satellites. I mean, right now you would call it CubeSats, but back then there were small sats basically. Yeah. Uh, and then basically over the years started trying to tackle bigger and bigger projects, uh, taking a lot of risk. I mean, this new space approach that you currently have right now, they were really at the forefront of that. They were taking on a lot of risk, doing very things very un- unconventionally, let's say like that, uh, mm-hmm. trying to, to fit, let's say, Russian intercontinental missile uh, launchers and trying to find German military satellites on there and, and everything is to get it as cost effective as possible. Mm. Then uh, basically through this approach, they were able to beat, let's say, the incumbent into the field, uh, so which was Airbus, which is now Airbus uh, within Germany, and uh, and basically yeah take a large part of the share of the market there. And then uh, over the years, uh, we started buying more companies. Uh, so we buy, bought, for example, Kalakavachi Space, which is now OHP Italy, which is also a system mm-hmm. integrator based in Italy. Uh, we founded a company in Luxembourg called Luxspace. It's also a small satellite mm-hmm. integrator. Uh, we bought OHP Sweden from um, SSC, I think. Yeah, so we basically we're a group of uh, satellite integrators. Uh, what's special about us is that we, uh, we're we not vertically integrated. So uh, we don't go down mm-hmm. the value chain. We don't make any of this, make some of the subsystems, but not many mm-hmm. and not many of the components. Um, okay. So most of the, our competitors are more vertically integrated than we are. Uh, for us, that's, I mean, it's a weakness and a strength. Uh, the strength is you can make very good system level designs 
uh, you don't yeah. have, you know, th- we have to take this component because it belongs to our group. We were much more flexible when it comes to that, which is very mm-hmm. helpful. Uh, of course, you cannot really do leverage or scale effects. I mean, uh, our competitors can, can do it more easily. <laughs> they can do, okay, if we don't make the cost on a system level, we'll make the co- the, the, the profit on the component level. Uh, but, but, you know, overall, I think this is uh, a benefit that we had over the last couple of years. Uh, and we're, we've become very strong at this. So uh, we've grown quite significantly over the last few years, about 3,000 employees now, uh, which is interesting there. On the, on the vertical integration side, I just have to ask, I mean, there's been so much, you know, news about, you know, not only in space, but in general about like supply chain issues globally, right? Um, have you guys, has that held you back in any way because you're not vertically integrated? I mean, I remember having this conversation, I think it was at Satellite in DC early this year, I asked somebody like about the waiting time for something very simple, like a Star Trek. And he was like, oh yeah, 12 months. <laughs> like, what are you kidding me? <laughs> that, that's short. I mean, depends. <laughs> I, yeah, okay. I mean, it, it, it really depends. So um, it, it it hinders us in the, to a certain way, yes. I mean, um, uh, let's say the large part of a company is focused more on institutional projects and those have very long lead times in any case mm. so yeah. there I mean you've already ordered it it get, gets more to a problem when your suppliers don't get their parts I mean the triple E parts or those kind of mm. things if they require on that they will have delays which means we will have delays um, yeah that, that really definitely impacts us um, but but it's less the case for example if you would have a, a truly 100% commercial business and you can just not you know you're supposed to live a satellite within a year and you have to wait another year for for your components to arrive I mean that impact is, is a lot harder of course mm. um, but but yes of course we, we feel it as, as, as very much as well now if you, you you're mentioning institutional projects so does that mean you're sort of main customer base is uh, people like space agencies currently still yes uh, we, we do so we have several parts of the company so OHB system which is placed in Germany where we mostly mm-hmm. do institutional business uh, the other companies the smaller satellite integrators are focusing more and more on commercial business okay. um, so there there it's a lot more of a mixed um, and then commercial business is always a bit I mean you have export business so for example selling to another government we can say it's commercial or my export business and then really truly commercial business so it's a, it's a bit of a mix there and depending on which companies are usually the smaller your satellite gets the the larger let's say a potential commercial uh, uh, part gets so mm. basically I mean very large satellites commercial context is only telecommunication yeah yeah it's a one so, and a half ton commercial satellite that much <laughs> yeah 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 so for the um, your I guess subsidiaries or the parts of the company that are pursuing more um, commercial customers so we're talking I guess CubeSats and small sets there? Focusing more on small sets. So we do CubeSats as okay. well, but we're not a CubeSat platform provider or anything. Okay. Like that. We provide okay. CubeSat <laughs> systems. And if we talk about a system, then it's here. We arrange the launch. We arrange the, the development of the payload. We maybe procure the platform or, or something like that. And we basically offer an end-to-end solution to a customer. Yeah. Okay, so somewhere we're talking sort of, you know, those companies would be playing in, broadly speaking, in the space where some company is playing like, I don't know, like in a particular order. Um, actually, no, let, let me take a particular order. Nano Avionics, our sponsor. Thank you very much. Uh, AC, Clyde Space, um, GOM Space, Terran Orbital, Endurosat. People like that, right? The, the, those are not our competitors because we don't go into the platform range. I mean, Nano Avionics, perhaps with a new pl- platform a little bit, uh, but we're doing in a different class a little bit. I mean, we are focusing on very uh, a bit more higher reliability, longer lifetime, uh, more currently okay. things. So we, we go, let's say, minimum. I mean, we like I said, we we do CubeSats if a customer wants it, but our real down limit is basically 80 kilograms uh, going Okay. 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 Um, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, I guess most of the people, if all of them I mentioned, would be smaller. Although I know, I think quite a few of them are sort of talking about um, hmm. um, offering bigger platforms now because I guess that's where they see that's where they see the market going. Is that something you would agree with? That we're kind of moving back towards bigger, like relatively bigger sizes from like you know, like a few years ago, CubeSats was like the big buzzword, right? Yeah, I think uh, what a lot of companies uh, uh, realize is that that I mean, CubeSat is nice but you you have severe
severe lifetime issues and, and severe mm. payload capability issues. I mean, I, I think, for example, what Planet or Spire does and what I've able to, to get out of the performance of a CubeSat is, is quite impressive, uh, but but you come to certain physical limits. Uh, and if you want to work a business case, I mean, uh, a CubeSat, I mean, lifetime one or two years, if you go for a bigger satellite, like where we, for example, are you have seven or eight years, uh, I mean, in the end, if you look over the lifetime, what the performance will be in your cost per year, you know, it very quickly becomes a better option. Take a little bit, yeah, higher reliability, a bit small, bigger satellites. So I think especially the class range, let's say 50 to 200 kilograms, will will get a, a bit of a growth. It's only part of the market. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we see a huge growth, of course, into the two to 500 kilogram, but those are mm-hmm. uh, not really for platform providers because those are dedicated constellations. Uh, those are yeah. the, 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 the mostly the telecom mega constellations. Sure. But those yeah. things you cannot really uh, yeah, tackle as a platform provider because that's not what we do. I mean, we make a platform and we sell to multiple customers, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 different customers, and we put different payloads on there. And that's a little bit what our market is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the other the other interesting thing that I noticed that may be going on with some of the um, integrators is some sort of vertical integration, right? Uh, and it even starts as far back as the launch providers. So it's sort of like, you know, launch providers, um, I guess to some extent Rocket Lab and then Astra said, okay, um, I guess they realized they have to fill their launches, right? So they started kind of doing satellite platforms as well. And then some of the satellite integrator guys, like um, I mentioned before, um, Terran Orbital, um, I guess they started realizing they need to like, you know, um, create demand for their platforms. So they're like, it's like, okay, let's do our own constellation for something, you know, like typically, you yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> but it seems to be this kind of like general vertical integration going on, I guess, sort of like trying to generate demand. Is that also something you're seeing? And how, how would OHB think about this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely true. I mean, the grass is always greener on the other side, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for a rocket manufacturer into satellite, I mean, it's a bit of a different reason why Rocket Lab did it. Of course, they were, were very much fun yeah. with back and yeah. they, they managed to get some good opportunities there. But but also like companies like uh, you know, uh, Spire, uh, for example, Officer Satellite yeah. as a service, uh, those mm-hmm. kind of things. So they come a little bit into to other areas as well. And of course, that does make sense because it broadens up your market. You try to grow to an area where you think that the profit margins are, are bigger. Um, so that, that makes sense to, to diversify. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not sure that the vertical integration is always the way. I mean, if you check the planet, mm-hmm. I mean, they, they build and design their own satellites in a time where basically there was no market for cubes. No alternative. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they argue, they really say, okay, actually right now we would do it again. If we would start from scratch now, we would not do that. We would buy components on the market. Yeah. Use a competitive industry, you know, uh, that's much more, much better. But at the time, you had no market for for such a thing. So, vertically mm. integration is good if you have a lot of money behind you. You can dominate the mm-hmm. market. You know, you become a monopoly, or by mm-hmm. pushing that price difference. Uh, if there's already an established market out there, that might not be the best way to go. To be honest, um, what yeah. a lot of companies do, they focus more. They go to an area where uh, currently there is no market. So, I mean, satellite as a service. Is a, is a new concept, which which is mm-hmm. uh, for a lot of satellite manufacturers an, an interesting point of view because you go more, let's say, in a corporation with the operator point of view. Usually, the operators, if they're successful, they make a lot more money than developing a satellite. So mm-hmm. that, that does make sense. Um, yeah. So this is also an area where we're we're thinking of going for strategy. Of course, I cannot say too much about the strategy, but we're. Sure, just- sure. Our, our downstream domain, uh, which focuses especially on uh, yeah services and, and product based on Earth observation and, and satellite data. Um, so that's something that we're developing. Uh, we as a company, we tried, we decided to split our company into three parts. So the space systems part, which is the satellite integration, the aerospace part, where we focus on uh, launcher components, where we develop also our own launcher, Rocket Factory Augsburg, and we make airplane components. And then the third part is OHB Digital. And there we really try to focus our activities that we focus on the downstream. So we, for example, mm. uh, make a lot of uh, products and services, focus on the maritime industry, uh, focus on the railway industry. Uh, we focus on everything basically involving critical infrastructure. So mm-hmm. 
Line monitoring, uh, we, we do uh, air, airports, uh, logistic fields, harbors, those kind of things. That's a little bit our, our current focus of, of our interest there of, of the downstream applications. But we also focus, for example, with our VPC activities on more uh, agricultural applications, uh, for example, with our investment into Constellar, uh, mm -hmm. or our, um, yeah, basically activities focus on, on mitigating the impacts of, of climate change and carbon uh, 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 emissions monitoring. Uh, it's very mm -hmm. broad let's say a number of activities we're doing some of them were yeah. very advanced and some of them a little bit less uh, but this is the areas we're pushing mm, mm, mm. what would you say is sort of the underlying dna of the company so like when you know those maybe people come together from a big corporate meeting or outside or something from those you know three different parts of the companies what is sort of like the shared understanding culture whatever you want to call it um yeah so there, there's, there's within ohb there's a large degree of pragmatism uh, i would say <laughs> we just mm. try to to, to do stuff we don't have a very high uh, uh hierarchy there's not the uh, num there's only i think four layers within the company so mm -hmm. that's fairly quickly decisions can be taken very quickly also because we have a, a family ownership so the, the ceo of our company is also uh, representing the 70 percent shareholder of the company he, he's, <laughs> he's, he, the ceo is that's important the ceo is, is from the family right yes okay. yeah. so he's yeah. the son of the founders of the company mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and that makes things very easy because yep. you, know, you have to make a decision and and that can be done i mean within certain boundary conditions can be done very fairly quickly um i mean it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of like space spacex without tweeting right exactly exactly <laughs> yeah and that yeah that makes it very uh very easy to do let's say because it's also the i mean we are very much a family environment there um mm -hmm. you know the, the 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 former founder of the company uh krista fuchs she's like 83 84 right now and still comes to the office every day okay. <laughs> that we wow. still see her. she still goes into meetings complaining that we spend too much money and we have to be more uh, <laughs> let's say cost mm -hmm. effective and those kind of things so i mean that's that's definitely something that that lists through um the son of the of the of the ceo uh, is also quite often in the company now and getting more and more active um so yeah it's, it's a really it's a family company there and uh, it's not only the family that matters but all of the employees are, are part of the family and that makes it uh, makes it very nice um of course it gives a family has, has some tr trouble of course as well sometimes it's always uh, it, it's it's the way it's a certain soft thing it's about a lot about relations and everything i think overall it makes us very still very effective and uh and very agile which is uh, something that you usually don't get in a large aerospace company mm. yeah i mean for four layers of hierarchy for traditional large aerospace majors sounds like paradise <laughs> yes probably. Uh, yeah, and for three thousand employees, it's also quite a lot. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, um, I mean, family-owned, but I mean, you guys are also publicly listed, I think, on a German stock exchange, right? Yes, uh, we were publicly listed. Uh, so, thirty percent of our stock is free float. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's basically publicly traded. Um, okay, and I guess that sort of brings you know certain things with it, right? You know, quarterly or half yearly reporting. Maybe um, I guess probably some investment banks are uh, equity researchers following OHP. Yes, yeah. So. Um, so the, the the reason why we did it at the time is to create uh, transparency also for our company mm -hmm. for our customers um, because of course this kind of reporting need that you have to do adds a little bit of transparency that money is not wasted or those kind of things of course normally if you would have a company with 70 percent family ownership and 30 percent free float it's not really investor let's say super mm -hmm. attractive for a large investor to institutional investor yeah yeah so <laughs> it's 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 what we have is a lot of small uh, uh, shareholders uh, um, so that's that's not uh, too let's say interesting the good thing is it, it requires I mean the 70% keeps control over the company and so there's no mm. nobody else stepping in which is always the problem with such company that a large Chinese investor steps in and takes control of so those kind of things that will never happen with us so that makes it uh, makes it good mm. and i guess on the upside as usual is if, if you are listed depending on well depending on where the share price is um it can be used the uh, shares can be used as an acquisition currency as well in theory exactly exactly okay so maybe let's go through the three parts a little bit so um, in space systems on the integration side so i'm wondering since you guys are as you said you know value-added integrators and you don't typically do the components yourselves um is there any sort of opportunity you see in in certain satellite components and i'm asking that because you know we have a lot of entrepreneurs and potential entrepreneurs listening and you know maybe that's something you've seen is like oh i wish i could get like i don't know like you said better solar panels or, or something right 
So, so for me, I mean, um, for for me, what's more interesting is to develop something that's. Uh, so I think there's a lot of potential in the market to find cost-effective solutions. Uh, mm-hmm. There, let's say, so you always have different areas. You know, you can be technically a lot better than what is currently out there. That, of course, is a, is a little bit difficult to do if you're going to an established player. Uh, if you become a new mm-hmm. manager, it's it's really great to be cost-effective, and there you have a huge potential because honestly, a lot of uh, uh, let's say current components uh, uh, which are being developed in the space industry are, are ripe for disruption when it comes to a cost point. Um, it's just true. It's so expensive. I know. I mean, that's one of, I mean, as you know, I'm, I haven't been in space that long, right? Maybe like six yeah. years, but that's one of the first things I noticed is like that stuff is so expensive. Like why does a propulsion unit cost 300, 300 to $500,000, you know, for, uh, yeah. Or Star Trek, why does a Star Trek cost like whatever it is, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. I mean, it just seems so expensive. Yeah. I mean, but that's a little bit the market and eh? the market dominated up until 10 years years ago was by ECSS standards with at least within Europe uh, and, and uh, NASA has its own standards book and it's just an entire row of, of tests and, uh, and things that you have to do which is great for a science mission you know or a human spaceflight mission you want to make mm-hmm. absolutely sure you're building things for the first time so you try to test every on every level you know you do from from the most single component to you know to the little bit subsystem level and system mm-hmm. level and all of the tests you do stack on each other and you make absolutely sure Sure that there can be no failure. Um, right. If you go for more operational mission or more commercial mission, the fact that you've already built it and you're using the same components, you know, it, mm. perhaps you only have to do an overall system level test, um, which makes just a lot more sense. And that yeah. just really decreased uh, the cost. I mean, the biggest cost uh, in, the, in the space industry is is not, you know, the hardware or those kind of things. It's, it's the time it takes to make something, the amount of tests that you have to do, the testing facilities are expensive. You know, you have a marching mm. army sitting around, you know, if you do testing, they have to wait and those kind of things. So the majority of the cost is in there. Uh, but the good thing is the market is also moving more and more away from this this uh, very conservative approach. I mean, we call it now new space. It's just taking mm. more more risk it's or let's say handling risk differently it could mm-hmm. also be i mean one of our first projects that we did uh, um was for example the zaloop constellation for the german military uh, you could have built mm-hmm. the constellation with uh with uh with a number of well let's say two very high reliable satellites uh but what we did we, we just built six and <laughs> were mm-hmm. very less reliable let's say like that or let's yeah. say did not fully test it and we said okay if there's there i mean there they were still reliable they're still all flying they're are still doing very good um but but we had let's say a, a reliability or redundancy on an overall system level which which wasn't done at the time you know right um and and therefore you're you're able to put a different risk away from like a single system or a single subsystem or a single component you you t- treat it as an overarching uh methodology which uh, which focus on the entire thing so not only then your satellites but also your ground system and everything like mm-hmm. that and try to mitigate what is it can i do to make a cost-effective solution and by putting the risk at the right place. Um, and, and that's something that we've been very strong in, with in the beginning. Mm. Of course, you can save uh, a lot of uh, money by, by balancing this out. Uh, uh, in, a, in a very good way. Yeah. So besides people, um, besides some of the things where we talked about sort of like satellites getting relatively bigger again and sort of what you just mentioned, um, people getting um, lowering costs, any other sort of noteworthy trends on satellite integration you think that are worth pointing out? I mean, on, on satellite integration in itself, um, so the thing is always the more satellites that you build, the cheaper it will get, which is always the sure. case. I mean, it's the yeah. same thing with launcher. I mean, cadence of launcher, you know, the higher your cadence Yep. The cheaper your launcher will be. It's the same thing for for satellites. Um, and and of course, what we see right now with all of these mega constellations, that people are building more and more recurring uh, items, and therefore mm-hmm. processes change quite a lot. I mean, what I said already before, you try to focus on more on a system level, but also the way that you produce satellites uh, becomes more of a I wouldn't say serial production, but often more kind of a batch production, which is more usual. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, you have different tools, so you can use you can optimize different processes to that you can standardize different things and things just become the quality shifts a little bit from doing one quality process wise very good to focusing on a standard set of processes uh, uh focusing uh yeah to, to try to quit, get your quality there better so that's that's a lot of things that are included there one of my my yeah, most favorite examples is that uh you basically you build a, a satellite in a, a one of the the people doing large telecom mega constellations what they did is they've tested their 
first satellite exclusively, like really, really went down into detail, tested everything. And then everything what came afterwards, for example, for the thermal model, they just put an infrared camera, they put all of the heaters on or they put external heaters on and just checked if this is the same as a reference model of the first mm -hmm. one they fully tested. If there mm -hmm. is little, less than whatever, so many percentage deviation, it's check pass, you know, and that just makes things a lot easier or a lot cheaper you know this you only have to do this yeah. once you don't have to do it thoroughly but you don't have to do it for everything afterwards uh, which yeah. is that are. Yeah, and then, and that that all makes sense. It's like you said, it's kind of a going from really low volume production, not to yeah, I agree. I wouldn't call it mass manufacturing by any stretch of the imagination, but I mean, at, sort of at the extreme end, I think I think SpaceX is doing something like two hundred Starlink satellites a month now, and mm. so that that is of course very different from historical uh, satellite integration. Yeah. Um, how about um, we're talking mostly hardware, and I realized that there seem to be a lot of things going on on the software side as well. I mean, as to the number of startups that have been funded that sort of claim they're improving the software part of the design and production process in some way is that also something you're seeing uh for satellite manufacturing or in general for yeah for, um yeah well for 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 yeah for for um design and, and manufacturing i know and then there's obviously stuff for on-orbit operation but i was i, I meant more for design and uh, integration yeah, so, so for me the most interesting is is model based system engineering which is really on on uh, let's say hype or not high high but very much of a push happening right now so the problem that you have is that that's uh, uh with with let's say mass customization of what we're doing so basically you create different platforms where you do it from different customers and everything like mm -hmm. that uh, the, the 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 complexity gets really high and you don't really want to repeat everything yourself and you want mm. to automate processes as much as possible and you can really do this with with model based system engineering um, basically reducing the complexities there for example different simulation uh, loops you can do automatically you can do a, a fact check for example is this possible or not and there's many different things that are happening there it takes different roles into the early design of the uh, of the uh, satellite it's called more let's say concurrent design approach it's more implemented in there and mm -hmm. later stages it's more the model based system uh, so that's that's a strong push that it's happening right now it's also being picked up by the by ESA right now luckily so they're pushing that quite a lot as well and I think the the company that, that adapts those kind of tools uh, you know uh, product life cycle management system and a model based system engineering system uh, will definitely have an edge advantage there okay let's move on to to the second uh, part of the group, um, aerospace. But but as you mentioned, this includes um, sort of the the, the launch part um, through RFA Rocket Factory. Oxborg. Do you just want to give us a quick summary of you know people who don't know what what RFA is and what those guys do, and why did you guys decide to get involved there? Yeah, so so RFA is uh, we're building our own uh, micro launcher, the RFA one, um, which can launch for for multiple different uh, launch sites over the world, which is which is good. It's basically fully designed to fit into uh, to containers, so it's it's nice and easily shippable, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, good. It's designed to be the most low cost solution that you can get within this. Domain. Domain. So I mean everything. I mean if you come to to RFA, everything is focused on on low cost production as much as possible. They use, for example, mm. 3D printing as well. They don't really do all of the quality checks that we do for our satellite components. They they build it once, they check it, and then afterwards, you know, they they mm. they look for a more stable process and they don't uh, do all of the the fatigue tests and all of whatever you need on normal components. So everything is focused on the low cost manufacturing as much as possible. For their tanks, for example, they use uh, YAR large uh, brewing fats brewing tanks basically a manufacturer for okay. that can build stainless steel well, I guess I guess they are based in Bavaria so they are based see in Bavaria so fits. yeah so they, they, they use that so you know they don't use uh, they use unconventional uh, supply chain as well they're, they're, they're mm -hmm. almost nothing of them is uh, the traditional aerospace uh, supply chain try to find as much uh, yeah low cost solutions as possible I mean their their entire test setup for example has been just you know filling uh, a large uh, so they've made a test stand themselves which is just a metal frame and then basically it's shielded by several containers just filled with sand <laughs> and then they just you know they do the launch testing on that so it's it's yeah. It's an extremely pragmatic approach which they take. It's an extremely motivated team as well. They have experience. So the the main CTO Stephen Brishenk has a good mm -hmm. from uh, from Rocket Lab as well. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, which which is you know it's just helpful you know if you've been there and helped develop a rocket then it's just uh, great to to duplicate that experience uh, it's a very interesting engine design that they have uh, which is uh, yeah which is very good so yeah so yeah a cool team there and the the reason that we try to to get into that is we saw that that there is really a potential market there for a, a European launcher development into that range mm-hmm. um you know the Ariane is good for you know all of the large satellites that we have to launch. The Vega covers its part as well, but on the lower scale, which focuses more really on a cost competitive product and on uh, on smaller satellites, focusing more on, on for example on Earth observation, uh, there is really a large market opportunity there. So uh, mm. yeah, that's why we decided uh, we want to get into this as well. We found a really good team, partially uh, uh, coming from uh, from New Zealand back, but also part partially from the engineers that are working at MTI uh, Aerospace, which is uh, yeah. one of the companies making uh, uh, large components, not only for Ariane, but also for, for SLS and uh, from some other, I'm not quite sure if I can say, but definitely some other uh, US launchers as well. So they make mm-hmm. large tanks and large tanks, domes and, and those kind of things. Um, yeah, and so the, the combination of the smart people already having experience in large aerospace products and, and uh, let's say more new space environment uh, yeah, made us think that we have really something unique there. So it's also mm-hmm. the developer on launcher. Yeah, yeah. And I, I should say for listeners, actually, um, the, the two co-founders, uh, uh, Stefan Brieschenk and Jörn Spormann, were on the podcast about, I think, about 50 episodes ago. I should really have them on again, but <laughs> the episode is out there. Yes. <laughs> you can go from about two years ago, so people can listen and, you know, and see how that how that all went. And this is, um, just to put some numbers on this, I think this is a payload size is about a ton or so here. Yes. Uh, to, I think to lo- to lower 1,200 kilograms in, in a while. Not the first launch, of course, uh, but but that's the, the final aim there, to go into that mass range up to 1,200 kilograms. And... Is, is there an expected date for the first orbital launch? Oh, I, I cannot say. <laughs> I mean, I'm, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that's an expected date, but I don't want to say anything wrong. So. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Okay, cool. Um, let's move on to well, there's OHB. I kind of forgot to ask. Um, OHB, what does that actually stand for? I'm just going to guess the B is for Bremen or something. But what, so because yes. I mean, this is clearly it's, it's not a space company. Now. It's not something space, right? It's like OHB, but but it's, it's like some sort of acronym. Yeah, so OHB doesn't stand for anything uh, currently. In the beginning, so like I said already in the before, the, the history was this was like a hydraulics company. Uh, so it was called Otto Hydraulic Bremen. So okay. So- Hydraulic Bremen, and then they took over the company, and they're like, "Oh, they, we don't really want to change the name. The OHB is nice and short. Okay, we're just gonna make it uh, Orbitale Hochtechnologie Bremen, so Orbital High oh, Technology Bremen." Okay. And then you know that's such a mouthful, and then at some point they were like, "Okay, it's just OHB. It's not an abbreviation at all anymore. It's just OHB." Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's, that's 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 a cool story. Anyway, pragmatism at its finest. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 No need to change. Web domains and well, I guess this was before web domains were a thing, but anyway, yeah, exactly. That is like you're known by your name, and you have to change all of the formats and the letters and those kind of the, things. The, yeah, the, 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 the corporate uh, clothing and all of that. Yeah, like, exactly. Um, okay, so moving to OHB Digital downstream, and I, su- I suspect that's when we kind of move into OHB Ventures as well. So, what, what are some of the examples of you know your downstream activities, and then maybe if you want to cross over, you know, some examples of you know your investments, your publicly known investments at OHB Ventures, yeah, sure. So, um um, so, I mean, what we do, for example, there is, is uh, we, we do our resale of our AS data. So the Orcom data, that's mm-hmm. we do. So it's more for the maritime industry. So we also make uh, value-added solutions based on that. So basically, just put, uh, for those who don't know what it is, by the way, IAS is uh, automatic identification signal. You can measure, uh, you can uh, listen to AAS signals that every ship sends, uh, listen from space, and you can do the position of every ship over the world, as long as they have their AAS receiver turned on, which is unfortunately not always the case, but yes. Yeah. Uh, so we basically were a reseller for this data within Europe. We make basically uh, solutions for that. So that solutions could be, for example, for custom control, a ship comes in, you can see where the ship has has been in the past, uh, what it's been doing, and those kind of things. But it also could be uh, yeah, for more governmental applications, uh, saying, okay, uh, where are the ships that are, are going under my flag? Where are they? Or large shipping companies to check, okay, where are my currently ships at the moment? Uh, those kind of things. So there's many different applications focusing on that. Uh, we have a large part working on uh, on railway as 
as well. So most focusing on cybersecurity solutions and power okay. railway. It doesn't have too much to do with space, to be honest, but it's uh, it's something that belongs to our company and that's growing quite a lot, which is also good. Uh, we're also focusing on uh, navigation solutions, so fo- focusing more, for example, on uh, jamming and uh, spoofing of, of GNSS signals, um, mm-hmm. which is very interesting as well. We have an entire group or lar- the larger part of the company working on basically operations of satellites uh, and also antennas and ground stations. Mm-hmm. So they're basically focusing on the, yeah, basically <laughs> whatever happens on the ground with the satellite. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the entire, the buildup of ground station operations and afterwards and, and those kind of things. But we also do uh, large astronomy uh, telescopes, radio telescopes. So we also, mm-hmm. for example, a company in, uh, in Chile at the Takama Desert that uh, built different antennas for the European Southern Observatory. We're building things, uh, antennas in South Africa, Thailand, uh, those kind of things. So that's really focusing more on the on the antenna point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, so at OHB Ventures, um, what kind of... Um what kind of founders and opportunities would you like to hear from? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, what, what we're really looking uh, towards, I mean, OHB wants to grow the space sector. I mean, basically, we want to mm. ensure that the, the, the use of space is, is optimized as much as possible. And what we believe is that downstream has been neglected. There's a lot of potential there. Uh, you know, there's there's many data coming, for example, from the Copernicus satellites, also the Landsat, mm-hmm. those kind of things. There's many observation data coming down. Um, and and it's not been optimally used yet. Um, so that's definitely where we're something looking into. So companies focusing more on the downstream, focusing partially more on Earth observation. That's a little bit our strategic focus. It doesn't mean mm-hmm. that we're focusing only on that. There's definitely, if you have an interesting technology for a launcher or an interesting technology mm-hmm. for a satellite or something like that, we, we could be keen to invest as well. But we're focusing more strategically towards the parts that we don't master so more the mm-hmm. for us so we're officially what they call midstream so we don't look at the upstream yep. components too much more more the downstream so any kind of somebody has a great application uh focusing on any kind of space data or space service or using space communications or those kind of things there we are very interested in um an example of what we did in the past is for example on stellar where it was also recently announced mm-hmm. Participated to the latest funding round. Mm-hmm. Uh, they do um, they use infrared data from space to measure uh, drought in plants, basically. So they can see mm-hmm. if the temperature on top of plants rises, that the plant is thirsty. <laughs> to use very layman's terms, um, and and therefore you can see uh, it's a good indicator where there's drought. So you can do precision irrigation techniques. Uh, you can apply to that. Mm-hmm. Um, another company that we invested in is Sea Root, uh, which is a combination, for example, of the AES data we sell. So they use uh, historically tracks of where ships went. For example, you want, uh, for example, shipping routes from Hamburg to Los Angeles, and you can automatically see uh, if you want to ship a container. You can see how long it will take, what it will cost, and what the CO2 impact will be. Um, so you can basically optimize your routes based on that, and you can also do a past reporting uh, on what the CO2 impact uh, uh, your container shipper, let's say per container, the CO2 impact that was actually made by this shipping movement. So they can check then, for example, what is the ship, what is the motor that it took, what is the the the, the, the weather that was on the sea and those kind of things. So they can mm-hmm. backtrack and see exactly uh, how much fuel was consumed, basically transporting this container from, from A to B. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we're kind of coming towards the end of this episode. I mean, as usual, we could keep going for hours here talking about space. But let me uh, close by asking a couple of questions. So, you know, if I think first question is relevant both for your strategy, strategy activity as well as for ventures. Um, you know, if you were to go back to the time of your master's and PhD and you had to think of disruptive space technologies in 2022, what would be some key highlights of the update? So th- right now, looking into the future, so yeah, for, for me, let's say, uh, the still onboard processing uh, will definitely change it. I mean, mm. 
we already see Omber processing quite active now in telecommunication, on earth observation. We are, there's nobody who has successfully applied it into a business case yet. Uh, and that for me is, is really the future. Uh, I also see the, the the more, let's say, coming up of, uh, of data relay solutions uh, mm-hmm. as well as coming up. I mean, this will really embark a little bit so currently what we've currently always been doing i mean earth observation has always been you observe something and then a few hour later so you can only pro- get the data down and you can really process yeah. it until it gets to the end user any kind of data you get is is one or two days year old and that makes it yeah. uh, the economic value of it not as much and i be- believe very much that that's especially is almost processing in this data relays We'll come to a certain kind of now casting where you can really see, mm. okay, what is happening currently around me now. And that will really, uh, uh, let's say, accelerate uh, the applications uh, of this. That in combination with automated uh, uh, processes that you have on, on ground. So that could be, for example, machine learning or artificial intelligence, but it could also just normally be in embedded processes in, in existing digital architecture. Um, that you really come to a way where, you know, an end user sees directly the information that it's that it needs and it's it's recent you know it's it's less than half a, an hour old and then all of a sudden uh, a range of new applications get as possible and uh, for me that that is the most interesting part which is going to happen in the future and that will will drive a lot of the the developments and innovation yeah that's definitely a good one and, and i'm sure we could kind of talk about some others but but let's leave it here for today and then the last traditional question of every episode is uh, is about science fiction <laughs> do you, so Agra, do you like do you like science fiction and if yes what are some some examples of books tv series movies that you like uh, my, my favorite book of science fiction is uh, is the june series uh, mm. Robert. Mm-hmm. i mean I've read this book like 15 times since I was very, very young. So yeah. I mean, I, re- I read many science fiction books, but that's the one that I always keep coming back to. So mm-hmm. for me, it's 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 a, a very nice uh, a mixture of science fiction, but also not too science fiction. So it doesn't have mm-hmm. too much computing power and artificial intelligence. Everything focuses on the mm-hmm. mind. So it's a psychological one as well. It has very much to do with politics. And, and for me, mm-hmm. that's absolutely fascinating. This world of this, you know, huge sand dunes and huge worms and this kind of like forecasting the future as well yeah yeah it's too no, for, fully agreed. It's one of my favorites as well. And it's like, I think you can come back at various times in your life, and it's gonna mm-hmm. you're gonna read it in slightly different ways. And uh, you, can, you pick up yeah. always different things. So for me, like I said, it's uh, it's my must read every one to two years. Uh, the first book. Uh, I mean, there, there's many more books. I don't read the entire series, but the first book, definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in in that way, uh, fear is the mind killer. People don't know what that means. They have to go read the book. They yes. Read yeah. <laughs> Like, well, thanks so much. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. And we'll do Thank this again sometime. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> bye bye. Nice bye bye. <laughs> And that's a wrap for another nominal episode of the Space Business Podcast. Once more, if you enjoyed this, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple or Spotify. You can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. You can support us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. Lastly, if you have any feedback, including ideas for guests, and that may include yourself, if you have an interesting space story to tell, or interested in being a sponsor, drop us an email at spacebusinesspodcast.gmail.com. See you for the next episode.